Welcome to Crazy Tech Stories, where Hacker Noon brings you a handful of stories from the community at large. I'm Derek Bernard. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we have the final four crazy tech stories from the larger series of talks presented in association with Indeed Prime and Huckletree at Huckletree's London location. Our first talk is from Priyan Shah, co-founder of Ieco AI. He discusses why the backup for your backup is your best friend. These are slide presentations, so if you're listening on audio, head on over to the YouTube channel, click subscribe, and follow along. Here's Priyash. So, hi, I'm Priyash. Uh, as you said, I'm a co-founder of Hyper AI, and I'm a software engineer, which means that basically we get paid to write bugs and then go back and then fix them. <laughs> <laughs> so, to really cover this disastrous event that you can copy and execute, um, I gotta go back several, several years to graduate high school to explain a little bit more about the context. So, some of you may be familiar with this drink, some of you may not. To me, it is the object of a nightmare because to most of you, it's probably just Mucho Mejor or Arizona. But you see, this drink is actually quite devilish. This drink is the subject that completely destroyed an entire focus. <laughs> So this all started when, um, when I met him. I was in high school several, several years ago, and um, being a high schooler, uh, I did not follow uh, any type of source control. So to keep a copy of our code, we basically had this USB. Uh, yeah. We would plug our USB into the computer, and any time you need to move the source or provide it to the computer, or move it in any way based on a copy, we basically zip the entire contents of our code base move it into this USB and then hand it off. Um, this also means that a backup of our code was only ever made when we needed to move our code to the USB. Now, what this means is obviously this is a very painful process, right? So it's not like we're going to keep backing it up. That would be too obvious and too sensitive. So what we did instead was um, we would just work off this one machine. Uh, anytime you need to make a change to the code base, you need to ask whoever was using the machine. They would step off for like an hour or two and you would go to edit it. Um, so this basically became our uh, one standing copy of like, our ground truth for our code base. And our ground truth fell victim, you see, to this horrible, horrible demon. <laughs> uh, one of our team members left the on cats open next to the computer and one quick spill later uh, everything was gone. Uh, to give even more context, this computer is actually the only computer that could interface with our hardware at the time. So not only did we lose a month's worth of code work, but we also lost the only computer capable of interfacing with our hardware. Um, we also lost our keyboard and our ROM. So obviously after this experience, I was going to start and I came up with two ground rules that I was going to follow where here in this project and in the future, just the personal rules. One, no open drinks in the And two, to obviously always keep a backup. Now, this seems like common sense and that's what I thought at the time. Like, what's the goal of having a backup for my code? I basically follow the steps. No. Um, so, a couple of years later, I'm working on another project, right? Um, this is right before I got to my current startup. Uh, it's another AI startup, and they were doing some new computer vision. Now, if anyone here has worked with computer vision before, you know it's a tremendous pain to get work. Um, there's about 1,500 libraries that go into making one computer vision app work. Um, and they, they're usually all installed. I guess nowadays you just have been to install computer vision. But back then, a couple of years ago, you would install every single thing manually. You would install Boost, you would install uh, Native Boost, which you, for some reason you did. You would install CUDA, which depends on a certain version of NVIDIA. CVDNN, which depends on a certain version of your GPU, which will never agree, so it's kind of weak on that. And um, it just gets to the point where it's, it's total pain. Um, so, conveniently, there's a tool now that we have that fixes all this called Docker. Uh, for those who are familiar with it, it's, it's a container system. You basically give it your dependencies, and every time you launch it, uh, it runs with the environment you have. Uh, it's very similar to like Python virtual end. Uh, it's a standard container issue. So there's conveniently a Docker file that has about half the libraries that we need. And the other half of the libraries, you're just able to install through DevOps over the course of a few days on uh, this uh, AGPU that we were training on. Of course, this causes one issue. If all our libraries and dependencies are in the Docker, and 
and the rest of our framework is in the machine, then how do we get both of us to agree? So we came up with perhaps the worst solution in the history of Docker. Um, we mounted our Docker container on the entire file system of our machine, uh, obviously ignoring the 30 warnings and errors that it generates along the way. And we, for those of you who again, don't know, you can mount a container onto a volume, and they'll use that volume, but that also means that container can then change that volume. Um, and in certain Docker containers, or I guess a lot of Docker containers, when you stop using a container and shut it down, it actually goes and deletes all of the files it has access to. Um, so if you mount this to your entire file system, you lose everything. That was Priyan Shah, co-founder of Aiko AI. You can find him on hackernoon.com slash at Priyansh. This next talk is from Hacker Noon CEO David Smook. He points to what makes Hacker Noon valuable to the global tech community. Here's David. Uh, one man or two man operation for so long, it's so nice to work with people. You know, <laughs> and um, I think it's been a little bit of a funny operation. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about rebuilding what you've already built. Uh, a bit about my company and a short history of the internet. Uh, these are some of our upcoming custom emojis right here. Uh, very pixelated, you know, so you can react to some stories. Uh, but Hacker News as a whole, uh, 8 million page views a month, uh, 7,000 contributor writers, and we build our product with Medium uh, 1.0. And uh, that's kind of the state of you know, where we were. And the challenge in front of us is how do we remove their infrastructure from our domain? And so, you know, we could have done another content management system, but a lot of, like, when we went to the drawing board, it was a lot of, like, we think we have rare insight in how content should work. And so on the left here, you know, it's, 
basically pixelated poop in the medium infrastructure, and on the right is pixelated poop in our infrastructure, and it, it looks pretty similar. They're both pixelated poop. And if you go to hackerpoop.com, you can get this emoji. And you can also make your own emoji in the emoji maker at hackernewpoop.com. Um, <laughs> but um, it, there is a little bit of a feeling of like doing what you already did, because it's like you get further and further down the road, and then you're like, oh, now we have to rebuild the functionality again. So it's, it's a, we're, but the, the cool thing about where we're at as a company is we're moving from just a publishing company to a software company. And it makes us a different operation, but it, in my mind it was like an exciting thing to like take the next step of the journey. But it felt, you know, like this, like doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is actually the definition of insanity. So there's parts about my business that maybe, you know, I shouldn't be doing, but it is pretty fun, and I'm a little addicted, uh, to be honest. Um, but to take a step back and think about the internet, sort of think about the internet and how you fit into it, whatever you're building, you know, products or startups or any type of internet company. So, you know, I would argue that what drives internet usage is, uh, first of all, accessibility, identity, discovery, uh, consumption. And then some B2B company that is semi-secretly powering almost everything behind the scenes. Which you should always keep in your minds about why you're here or why you're anywhere. You know, there's a lot, the way money works is important. But who powered the internet to start? You know, so if you think about accessibility, it's the companies like American Online. Like who got us online in the first place? Like what's the first time you dialed up? And you think about identity for those of you who are old enough in the room. Uh, MySpace. You know, that was the first public page where it was yours. You know, it was your page on the internet for most people. And then Discovery, you know, it started with Ask and Ask Jeeves and, you know, other query searches. And consumption, the reality is, porn is what drove all the early consumption on the internet. And if you want to learn the history of the internet, follow the technologically developments in the porn industry is actually very educational for looking how the internet will affect other industries. And then behind the scenes, you know, they always say, like, IBM. I mean, I'm always doing something, but if you, you know, look at it more today, and who powers the internet today, I would argue accessibility is, starts with our smartphones and our devices, and how we're able to access the internet from everywhere. And Apple is the company really driving accessibility. And identity, you know, billions of people on Facebook, they've kind of taken over our identities for a lot of people and our social relationships in a lot of negative ways too, but in a very market dominant way. Um, and discovery, you know, Google is now a verb, and that is how we discover things, and that is the source of truth, you know, for better or worse. And consumption has gone more mainstream, uh, and you see here, you know, Amazon for goods and Netflix is basically the new streaming model that all the other streaming services are following, and from Disney on down, they want to subscribe, and that's the model. And then with Microsoft, you know, from LinkedIn to GitHub to their actual products, you know, they're actually really shaping how we interact with a lot of the internet and a lot of our business with the internet today. And if you start to add this up, you know, you look at Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and that's a $3.8 trillion market cap. And so whenever we look at what that means, right here, this is a man, these are stacks of $100 bills. And that's what a trillion dollar looks like if we were to see a trillion dollars in front of us. And this is 3.8 trillion. So to think about how much money these guys are worth, you know, it's, it's very useful to also, you know, put it against other important things here. You know, looking at the top 50 companies in Europe, add them all together, it's less than these five. That's, that's, what, that's what technology means. You know, you look at the entire GDP of this country, India, Germany, each one of those is less than these five companies. That's how dominant, you know, technology is today. And for all the cryptocurrency we publish and all the dominance and all the talk of you know, changing money, out of all the cryptocurrencies, multiply them by 17 and you're almost as big as these five companies. So it's, and the thing is we we're used to them because you know it's for me it's been my 20s, but this is 30 years. This is what it looks like for the internet to take over the world in 30 years. It's it's very it's a little scary, you know, but you you really it's a, these are useful numbers to actually understand the power of these companies. And then what I just want to, well, my learning here is internet first companies rule. That's just like, they rule. And it makes me ask, you know, who will power the future? 
of the internet? How does it affect you know, your startup and your business? Because if you don't act in relation to these companies, you're missing a, a big portion of the internet. Um, and the good news is it's easier than ever to build a digital product. You have all these services. Um, if we were building, rebuilding Hacker Moon right now 20 years ago, the first thing we would do is putting servers in my house. Like, I'm glad I'm not doing that. You know, I'm glad that DevOps is something that I don't have to deal with very much. But the bad news here is that when you build a new digital product, you still grow and validate these tech giants. You know, whether you're using your phone, whether you're using AWS, whether you're using GitHub, you know, Google for startups, which is who we're using. And it's, um, or you know, maybe you'll build up Squarespace, and Squarespace could actually be a company that maybe enter these top five, which I don't think it will, but there's a chance. But you know, everything kind of builds on top of each other with the internet. It starts with these giants at the top. And for us, you know, in other startups, like you have to put your the growth of your business, your product, and your service above, the, you know, maybe a moral high ground with more competition. And you know, so when we got a grant from Google for our hosting, we happily took it. You know, <laughs> maybe we don't like that they're a verb and they own the market and yada yada or whatever, but we want to grow too. And that's not, that is a cool thing about technology that it's creative destruction. They understand, like, hey, I'll cut out some of my markets so I can create 100 new customers. And I'll, I'll take the trade off. I'm, I'm fine with it. It's good. You know, it's not ideal. But I'd rather do that than not grow my business to the next step that I see it can grow. And I think my other learning was that I would rather not put a lofty mission statement out, and I'd rather work to a better site each day. You know, I don't want to be like the Jesus of publishing. And I don't want to say, like, hey, we're going to solve all your problems. We're not. We're a good place for you to publish. It doesn't have to be more than that. <laughs> like, it's, that's how I saw it. And, you know, with Hacker Noon 2.0, we want to take what has been, what we learned, and we want to plug it in. And the same process in a different time won't yield the same results. You know, we're going to go through the process of building a new product, and it's going to, um, We'll see, you know? Well, this is where I just want to do more of what's working. And that is three stories, you know, without barriers, without pop-up ads, to create accounts, um, and make it easier to get to your related content. And a big one is letting contributors choose their own call to action, and putting that front and center. And will it work? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, that's the reality of it. I think it's going to work. I'm very confident, and it's great to have a good team I trust in. But like, I also just don't like over promising. I don't like the way a lot of technology companies are growing from like a message first base. And this is just a preview of what it'll look like in blue here. You know, you have a contributor saying, "Go to my open source project." And you know, the biggest call to action on the page is the primary thing the contributor wants to do because they contributed to my site and they earn the right to their space. And they earn the right to say, hey, this is one of the pages that will drive traffic and the thing I want to grow on the internet because we want to help you grow the thing you want to grow on the internet. And so right now, if you want to reserve a handle on Hacker Noon, it's off on HackerNoon.com. A couple thousand have been taken so you can get a good name and have a good place to publish. And I just want to thank you all for your time here today. That was David Smook, CEO of Hacker Noon. You can find him on hackernoon.com slash at David Smook. Our third talk comes from Anthony Rose, founder and CEO of Seed Legals. He shares his approach to keeping your cool during a presentation. Let's see how he does. All right, there we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Anthony Rose. I'm founder and CEO at uh, Seed Legals. Uh, if you're doing a startup on your own, don't go to a law firm. This is the place to go. And I talk to a lot of founders each day, and I go to a lot of presentations like this in software, and I'm always amazed at how founders are often terrible at pitches. They sort of sitting there and they're reading from notes and they turn to us to the audience and look at their slides, and these are all bad things. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to talk about my baptism of fire, learning to stand in front of an audience. Because as a tech guy, you know, I'm an INTP, and I'd far rather be in front of my computer than on a stage. And at some point that changed. And when that changed, I was about 20 years, 19 years ago, I was living in Australia, I was CTO of a company called Brilliant Digital. And we did a real-time 3D engine. Um, it was really before video streaming, the days of 28K modems and so on. And we developed some very nice 3D engine and some compression technology so we could do interactive movies on the web. 
and we came to the attention of Intel and became part of Intel's dev program on their new pension and the next processors and their showers with love and so on. And then we wanted to shower wear, so we got into SIGGRAPH, the biggest 3D and the biggest graphics thing. This was in New Orleans. And then we were very nicely invited by Intel to go on Web 3D Awards. So they picked 30 of the world's best 3D companies to present, and they gave them access to pre-release Intel hardware, the new MMX processor, and so we had a work-in-progress engine, and uh, we were selected as one of the top three of these things. So we got three minutes to present, the others all got one minute. So I was in Australia with our team, we thought, Sigma, a couple of kiki 3D people, sounds great, let's do it. So we fly to uh, New Orleans and set up, and we discovered Sigma is huge. And then we discovered this event is huge. And I had insisted in our company that I was going to be the one doing the presentation. I was the CTO. Um, our 3D engine was like a finely tuned Italian supercar, which means it would blow up at any point. It would mostly not start, and if you get it started, you probably really would make it to the destination at that point. So we had this not quite fully working Intel hardware with a pretty buggy engine. And I get to have to fight with our company marketing team who wants to present. It's going, you guys are totally wrong. This is a geeky audience and the tech barely works, this would end badly. So I insisted. Also, we needed to go to our new funding round, so the future of the company was going to depend on the presentation working. And then Intel insisted they don't want to do some preview sessions over the two days before. And in all the preview sessions, the engine had crashed off to 20 seconds, I think 30 seconds, and two minutes. So it wasn't looking good, and I was on the call on the phone each night to the guys in Australia going, for fuck's sake, you know, fix whatever it was, I think we just make it work for at least four minutes. Um, so then the day comes, and it turns out there like 3,000 people in the audience, and we'd actually sponsored the drink, so they were slightly inebriated, and they were all being armed with ping pong guns for shooting you if you were more than one second over the time. And it would be cushions if it was boring or crashed or so between the two of them. So there I am thinking the night before, the future of the company depends on this. I pushed myself forward to do it. Our 3D engine is buggy as everything, and I have no idea what this massive audience. So no stress. Anyway, we were third up. I'm actually this is me over here, as you can see my head slightly shorter. Um, but it turned out that the, the first presentation, it crashed, the guys before me crashed, so like, the second one was pretty boring, so anyway, mine came miraculously, it worked, it was to the second I finished on three minutes, we didn't win, we came second, but you know, it was really good results. So now, whenever I have to be on stage, I think, you know, it's the future of the company at stake, you know, is there a real-time thing that's by the ads, and if not, I can show the lights. Anyway, about a decade later, when I was running BBC iPlayer, I got invited uh, by Microsoft to present at Microsoft PDC. So this was uh, somewhere, I think, in uh, San Francisco, and this is an entirely different scale. So after Bill Gates's infamous blue screen of death, Microsoft don't take anything to chance anymore. So they have triple backup on everything. And they must have spent like a million dollars on this event, just on the back screen stuff. So anyway, Microsoft worked with us at BBC to make a version of iPlayer that would sync across multiple devices. This was like in 2010, so fairly early days for these things, based on Azure and so on. And I thought, well, you know, I've done one of these big events. There's no one in the in the audience. This is the BBC, so it's not out of business if my tech fails. People probably blame it on Microsoft if it fails anyway, so <laughs> I'm not sure. But anyway, the event was quite an experience because um, there was multiple rehearsals. There was so much backup that they even found a person with similar hands to mine, and they had a complete separate shadow presentation of the person, you know, with under a camera with their hands on a phone. So if mine went down, they would just flip over seamlessly to the other. So when you watch those Microsoft presentations, you know there's more to it than the eye. 
So anyway, that was my baptism of fire. And since I see many people on stage pretty looking nervous, I thought I'd take the opportunity to present it. Thank you very much. That was Anthony Rose, founder and CEO of Seed Legals. You can find him on hackernoon.com slash at Anthony Rose. Our last talk and final talk of the Huckletree slash Indeed Prime slash Hacker Noon event is from Thomas Webb, a combination artist hacker. All of his work is programmed, infinitely looping simulations using algorithms he's created. Here's Thomas to tell you about it. Hey, yeah, hi, I'm Thomas Webb, what's up? Um, thanks for having me, guys. Big fan of Hacker Noon. Um, I published an article on the site, just like out of nowhere. And they put it on the front page, I was like, yes. So when I asked me to come, I was like, hell yeah, this is awesome. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about how I hacked 40 million people into thinking that I was like this super badass hacker. It's prop jokes. Um, so I used to be a magician in 2017. I got asked to go on America's Got Talent. And when that phone call happened, I was like, okay, I wonder what the current state of like knowledge is in terms of the American public when it comes to technology and even just people who actually know about technology. So like, I'm just gonna probably propose something to you. Like, my idea was how can I go into a room and without having any interaction with everyone in the room, take control of all of their devices? Anyone got any ideas? It's quite a hard one, right? Anyway, I can't with this. Uh, I want everyone to get their phones out, get your mobile phone out. And if you've got a, an iPhone, click on your camera um, and you can open up sort of like a built-in QR reader now. If you've got an Android, just set this one out and scan the QR code. Don't worry, I'm not going to like take anything from it, I promise. So when you do that, what happened is uh, I wrote this little program using PubNub. Um, PubNub's uh, like this real-time messaging platform. And what I realized I could do is, if you guys open this, it's going to ask you like some questions. You know, do you have an iPhone or Android? Um, if you want to come on stage, you know, there'll be a few memes. Just roll with it, answer the questions. Um, what I realized is that I could, if I, if I got all of you to load the web page, I could, I could assign you like a UDID and pass that through PubNub's uh, messaging stream onto my server. I'd have a list of all of the devices and then I could ping you all individually messages. So what I did is I wrote this little script which allowed me to send you like a JSON object telling you what color to change the, uh, the, the body tag on your HTML page. So if I click this button, I can, I can change it to all blue. Is your phone going blue? And then if I click this one, it's all black. Are you guys getting that? And then I can play like a GIF? Yes. Yeah? Put your hand up if that's working. I did write this code and as we know, bugs are real. Hey, he's got it. Look, you're being hacked. Oh my God, watch out. <laughs> anyway, so I did that uh, on TV and the next day, like all over the news, there's this kid who hacks people's phones and I was getting like legitimate like, companies hitting me up. Like people at IBM being like, we need some penetration testing done. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to click that again. If you look at your device, they're going to flash in different colors. Um, does anyone get the Pokeball? There's going to be a magic Pokeball. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Who got the Pokeball? Hey, I choose you. Come on stage. Just get a round of applause, please, for the hate Pokeball. In the meantime, I just forwarded you all onto my Instagram page. Hashtag hacked. All of y'all. What's your name, dude? You can put your phone away, man. Just, you can dump that. Uh, here's what we do. Everyone open up your calculators. Um, you can hold that, my man. Everyone open up your phones with your calculators. Who likes the blockchain? <laughs> I love doing this as like a joke when I do talks. I'm like, I'm going to explain the blockchain. So here's what we're going to do. All of you are going to help me authenticate a transaction on the blockchain. Whoa. Here's how we're going to do it. Simple equation. Um, uh, you have to follow this perfectly. Is that right, yeah? Everyone else has to follow this perfectly. So get your calculators out, and we're going to start off with this one. Hey, miss, how you doing? What size feet do you have? In European? Okay, so everyone type in 41. Then hit the multiply button. Let's go with this gentleman. Hey, what's up? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, can you follow this perfectly? You're like, yeah, I've got that, no problem. All right, 41 multiplied. Uh, can you give me what day of the month were you born? The A1 type in eight, and then hit multiply it again. And then finally, this gentleman at the back, hey, I'm pointing at you. Uh, what, uh, what number house do you live at? Three. Okay, everyone type three, and then hit the plus button. We should all now have 984, can I get a yes? Sick, okay, so you can put your, put your thumbs over the numbers, close your eyes, and hit exactly, wait, let me do the math. 
seven numbers, close your eyes at random, hit seven randomly, go. Oh, anxiety. What did you hear? All right, everyone needs to add nine million. So everyone do this, and you push add, and then you're going to do nine, one, zero, one, five, four, seven. Is that okay? And then hit equals. Go for it. Yeah. All right, we should all have... 9,102,531, can I get a yes? yes? Blockchain, you made a mistake. Um, yeah, so yeah, thanks for that one. That, that's ruined everything. Um, yeah, so usually what I say is like, yo, that's how the blockchain works. It's a meme, someone put me in a meme. Um, okay, so here's the thing. Uh, what I didn't tell you, I'll take that back. Keep, keep that, can we get a round of applause please for you and Tixi? Thank you very much. Um, Cool, keep that, keep that number up. Here's the thing, so there's no way I could have known what that number was going to be, right? Like three random numbers, you hit a random number, multiply them together, the math checks out, it's a blockchain. In my pocket here I have a Hacker Noon sticker, and on the back of it I wrote one number. Check it out, 9,102,531. Can I get a whoa? Whoa! Satoshi Nakamoto in the flesh. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I did that, um, and that was what I, what I was all about. It was really funny, because I remember hitting up um, Stephen Blum, who's the CEO of Pubna, and I was like, hey Stephen, I'm a magician, and I like technology, I want to make this thing, with this thing, and he came back to me with just this, like, Pubna boost magic. <laughs> what the fuck do I do with that, dude? And, and then I'm like, oh, just we need some resources, because it's kind of expensive, it's like 500 bucks or something, and he just comes back being like, are you a real person? <laughs> as, if I, I, as if I didn't seem like a real person. But anyway, so I did that and then um, uh, I decided that as fun as hacking was, hacking people, I actually did that again, second round on America's Kind you can check it out. I did the exact same thing, I just trolled everyone with technology. And I, I started to realize that what's really crazy is that like, obviously everyone in the room here, we understand judging by the content of the previous talks, a lot about technology, <laughs> but a lot of people really don't understand a lot about technology. Like the rate which is moving is absolutely crazy. And when you, when you sit down and have conversations with just everyday people about what they know, in not in a condescending way, just in a very natural way, you start to realise how mad tech is now. Like how crazy it is. So then I started to build. Uh, well, I just decided to quit my job, and I basically decided to build art. I was like, you know what? I love making things just for the sake of like conceptually making something. So I made this, and this has just been put up for the Emerging Artist of the Year Prize. Yes! Um, and basically all it is is the Twitter API, and I'm just grabbing the most recent tweet and sending it to IBM, and IBM are using the sentiment analysis of Watson and going, is it written by a person, yes or no? And then I'm just passing it through this and writing it out in a typewriter, which is like a few lines. I think it's, I think I nicked someone's code off GitHub to do the typewriter effect. Um, and that's, that's now like apparently a big art thing. But to everyone in the room, you'd be like, what? That's just like so basic. And what I started to realize is that there's this like tremendous beauty and artistic like conceptual license within the, the concept of coding. Do you know what I mean if you explain this to someone like, oh, there's like all of these little, little people running around the internet, like these little workers that are doing these tasks and it's happening every like millisecond or a hundredth of a millisecond. It's absolutely mind bending. But what, what really drove me mad about that piece was that the second someone hits tweet, it immediately appears on this mirror for you to see your reflection in. And the thing is, is that I didn't just pick any old tweets. I picked people who are tweeting about depression, which was something I was struggling with. So I was trying to find my reflection in other people and their emotions on the internet and end up with this, thanks to Twitter. So yeah, creative coding. Um, this one's great. So what this does is... I basically got the real-time uh, rate, the, uh, the real-time price of Bitcoin, and then I went back in time uh, using the API. It was so straightforward, and got the price of Bitcoin seven years ago because the finance people here will know seven years at ten percent is like double your money. And I basically just wrote a little algorithm that tells you how much money you made if you invested in Bitcoin with just a hundred dollars exactly seven years ago, and it comes out and it tells you it's like it'll be worth one hundred thirty-two thousand dollars. How mad is that? And it's, it's real time, so like when it changes, it can be really volatile because the price changed the past or the future. And then just for fun, I did the same thing with Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, Apple, and Facebook, all just using 11 stock APIs. And there's all these art people staring at it, like, 
oh, this just talks about the current state of like, I'm just like, bro, no, it's like four lines of code. <laughs> Wild. And then I did that, that's classic, just like an Instagram mirror, and I used tr uh, tweet tweets about Donald Trump, and then, because he's not on Instagram, and I put it into a fake Instagram live stream, so it looks like you're being Donald Trump on Instagram live. Controversial. And then this is great, this is one of my favorite ones. This is called The Ability to Destroy a Planet is Insignificant Next to the Power of the Force, which, if you're a Star Wars fan, will know it's a quote from General Tarkin, I believe it is. Uh, no, no, it's Vader talking to Tarkin just before they blow up Alderaan, which is like an Earth-like planet with the green laser beam of the Death Star. And what I did is I basically, I, I taught myself the internet how to wire Arduinos, which you should totally do if you've ever done it, because it's so much fun. And I got this to flicker every time a hex or a forest is cut down in real time using data that I found online. Why? Crazy, right? Look at, there we go, bam. Just like so mad, you can, you can bring all this data into the, into the physical realm, you know, because light is, a, is obviously a very physical, physical thing that we experience. This one's called Proof of Parallel. Guess where this is from? NASA. NASA's API gives you a photo from there. They've got a satellite in between Earth and the Sun. And every two hours, they beam like a, a 1,000 pixel square image of the Earth. So I put that into an affinity mirror, proof of parallel. It's for all the flat earthers. <laughs> and then I decided to do this. I was like, okay, there's definitely something here. Like, I really want to try and see if you could make art that would break through into the commercial realm. So I tried to work out how, how does one put a TV screen, essentially, on someone's wall and not make everyone go, that's just a TV screen, mate. Um, because all my art runs computer programs. So I built this, it's a digital infinity mirror. I worked out a way to do multiple layers of infinity. It's like I create this like illusion. Isn't that fun? This one's called algorithm. It's to do with the Instagram algorithm and yeah, feels. <laughs> and then this one's great, which is probably a bit explicit. But yeah, you can just do so much cool stuff with code. Like it's just a physics, this is Box 2D. If you've not used Box 2D, it's like a, really old school 2D physics engine. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, an if, if, it's a for loop, it's a for loop and an if statement or two. Pretty straightforward. This one's great, this one's really great, I love this one, okay. So, this is um, all the tweets I could grab about from Twitter, and then I changed the font from like, you know, standard font into uh, Japanese, like katakana, and then made it a matrix infinity mirror. So it was my way of being like, this is the internet. And obviously people who don't know code are just like, how have you done this? You're a genius. And I'm like, three lines of code. <laughs> so yeah, anything is possible in three lines of code. I mean, Thomas Webb, thanks guys. Great to meet you. That was Thomas Webb, artist slash hacker. You can find him at web with two Vs dot site. You can also find him on hackernoon.com slash at website. That's all for today, y'all. You can find the slides and videos for these presentations on youtube.com slash hackernoon. And for the love of God, click subscribe. For crazy tech stories. I'm Derek Bernard. Over and out.